I want to talk about the final victim. Marie Kelly. Yes. She was butchered like an animal. At the same time, there, there was this element of ritual. She was laid out on her own bed. She is the only victim to have been discovered indoors. Uh, and she was laid out in a sort of ritualistic fashion with uh, one arm folded across her chest. Um, what there was left of her chest. Both her breasts had been cut off. Uh, her heart had been torn out. Her entrails had been pulled out and intestines were thrown all over the walls and hung on the picture rails. Uh, as I say, her breasts had been cut off and they were on a side bench by her bed with her, along with her liver. Uh, there was blood everywhere. This lady, a lot of things hinge on Marie Kelly, don't they? Everything really hinges on Marie Kelly or her conduct. Uh, an old nun who was interviewed in 1973, uh, she then lived at Providence Row Women's Refuge, which was only two or three minutes from where Mary Kelly had lived and died, remembered an elderly nun in 1915 saying, and, she, and this elderly nun had been around at the time the, the killings had taken place, saying to her, if it had not been for Mary Kelly or Marie Kelly, none of the women would have been murdered. In other words, there would have been no Jack the Ripper. Uh, and as I say, so Mary Kelly's story and what led up to the events of autumn 1888 are crucial to the whole affair. Jack the Ripper is a misnomer. And that is true because Jack the Ripper was not one man, but three. All working together for a specific purpose. Let's go one step past that and look at these five prostitutes and say that in an area the size of London out of 80,000, they were all from roughly one pretty small area and in fact they could have had more connections than being common victims. Absolutely. Once again, this is a point which has never been brought out before. Nobody has researched the case deeply enough to have discovered this central point. Out of all the prostitutes in London, 80,000, Jack the Ripper killed five. And all these people representing the killings as random maniac killings just do not consider that these women all knew each other. Two of them lived in the same house. They all, three, three of them lived in the same street and all of them rubbed shoulders daily in the same pub. Amazing. Which is 20 yards from where Mary Kelly was killed. Now, if we get back to what that nun said, if it had not been for Marie Kelly, none of these murders would have happened. Let us now look at why this lady becomes so important. Was she a witness? To something? Did she know too much? To answer that, I have to take you from the East End back several years to the West End of London. Right. And back to Walter Sickert. The painter. The painter. Mm. The father of Joseph Sickert, my informant, and the original source of the story which I was investigating and which at every step I took became truer. <laughs> We now find ourselves in 1884 in Cleveland Street in West London. Sickert's studio was in Cleveland Street and just opposite the studio was a sweet shop, confectionery shop, in which there worked a girl called Annie Elizabeth Crook. Mm. She was a poor country girl and a Catholic. Sickert's antecedents were quite impressive. 
His father and his grandfather had been painters to the royal court of Denmark. And he knew both Princess Alexandra, who was Danish, and her husband, Edward the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII, well. He wa was approached by Alexandra in the early 80s to take her son, Prince Eddie, under his wing because Eddie was becoming stifled at court. He was mixing only in the very narrow circles of, of the court. He, he was having no outside experience at all and, and she was very worried about his personal development. And she wanted him to see the world of art, to, to just see a wider life uh, and more of his future subjects because had Eddie lived, he would have become king in 1910. Mm. And Sickert readily agreed. He was always ready to ingratiate himself with the powerful for obvious reasons. He, he didn't have all that much money and he wanted to get on himself. Uh, so Prince Eddie, uh, who was Queen Victoria's grandson, of course, began to pay secret visits to Sickert in the guise of his younger brother, Albert, Albert Sickert. And so here we have them in those early years of that uh, decade, getting on together very well. Sickert goes out with uh, Prince Eddie to the pub. Uh, and, and Eddie sees all sorts of things that he would otherwise not have done. All right, Stephen. Prince Albert Victor Christian Edward, future King of England, and the great artist Walter Sickert. The prince now with his newfound alias, able to enjoy the part-time life of a commoner. So what were they getting up to? Was it out dropping a few pints of ale, or were they a wenching, or... What were the typical activities that Sickert and, uh, and Eddie were getting into? Well, both of those things. Um, and Eddie took a few brief painting lessons from Sickert and met all Sickert's friends who were a motley bunch and was generally enjoying himself. Sickert knew this, a girl who worked in the shop opposite, Annie Elizabeth Crook, as I said. Mm. And... He was sick. It was very fond of this girl, and he introduced the the pair, Eddie and Annie. Eddie was struck by a certain similarity of this girl to his mother, and he got on very well with her. And eventually, he fell in love with her, and she with him. And they were secretly married. He couldn't officially marry her. Uh -huh. She was a Catholic for a start. Oh yes. Um. He was under 25, so he would have had to get permission to marry her. He married her under a false name, but he married her nevertheless at a St. Saviour's private chapel near Cleveland Street. Then, in 1885, Annie bore Eddie a child, a daughter, who was born at Marylebone Workhouse, and who was christened Alice Margaret Crook. She underwent two baptisms, an Anglican ba uh, baptism for Eddie and a Catholic baptism for Annie. But inevitably, it reached the ears of the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury. The throne was very unpopular at that time. There was constant fear of revolution, and S Salisbury himself was especially frightened of anarchists, socialists, there was a rising tide of socialism and the government was very unpopular, the throne was very unpopular. He believed that it would take very little anyway to end the monarchy with Victoria's death. With Prince Eddie's behaviour, he believed that if that became public it would be almost a certainty that the monarchy would end and, and end immediately, that there would be revolution total revolution in England. Uh, so that information about Eddie marrying a Catholic, because anti-Catholic feeling then was incredibly intense. Mm. If He had to keep that silence at all costs. So he staged a police raid in Cleveland Street while Eddie and Annie were together. Eddie was taken back to court and severely reprimanded 
and Annie was taken away and confined in a hospital. And she spent the rest of her life in hospitals, workhouses and prisons after some sort of primitive brain operation had been performed on her. Or well, some perverted to, lobotomy. With... Something like that, to erase all memory of her past yeah. and her alliance with, with the prince. During that raid, the child escaped with her nanny and that nanny who had been taken on by Sickard was Mary Kelly Mary Kelly escaped from Cleveland Street taking the child with her and she escaped to the East End eventually the, the child found its way back her way back by a, a circuitous route to Sickard and Sickard arranged for her upbringing in France with some friends there Mary Kelly fell in with a group of prostitutes and eventually, completely down and out, they resorted to blackmail. She shared her dangerous knowledge with them and they blackmailed someone closely associated with the, the case. The fear was that these women who were walking around the East End knew of Eddie's conduct mm. and were therefore in, in possession of information that could topple the throne. So like Annie Crook, they had to be silenced. And the Prime Minister put the operation into the hands of a man he trusted very greatly because that man had been very closely associated with silencing Annie Crook. Salisbury, I'm sure, never wanted anybody murdered. He put the case into the hands of this man, as I say, whom he trusted. Mm. This man decided the women must die. To have them certified as lunatics, he thought would be dangerous in the extreme. One lunatic was bad enough, but if you had four, five, six lunatics all crying out the same story, somebody was going to see a pattern somewhere. Right. And, and you know, there were plenty of very high-ranking articulate politicians around who were, would have been eager to see that pattern and use it against the throne and the, the government. In power. Victoria knew nothing about this. Right. I mean, she, she wouldn't have condoned murder or, or silencing in any way at all. Sickert told his son, and his son told me, that the women were murdered according to Freemasonic ritual. That much of their ritual is based on murder. They are a secret society. On the whole, they are a society which does good, much good to charity, but they are a secret society of men who meet and perform rituals. Some of their basic rituals are the mime of mythical murders, some taken from the Bible, some taken from Egyptian myth, and these murders are the cutting, or, or let's take one example, the sign of the entered apprentice, the lowest rank of Freemasonry, is the cutting of the throat from left to right. All the ripper victims had their throats cut from left to right. At another degree, the mime for initiation is for the victims, heart and vitals to be taken out and thrown over the left shoulder. Stephen, why? Why this particular mime? I mean, where does this begin, this, this whole story of... Why do they go through the mime of this? Well, simply to preserve the secrecy of their, their order. Um, a, a mason swears on pain of terribly violent death. This kind of death? Yeah, all these various kinds of death, mm -hmm. and, and, and it varies from level to level, yeah. um, that he will retain the secrets of his order and never betray another mason. Mm. Um, when you've reached a certain level in masonry, you 